etymology of English. English, people of England, the speech of England, Old English, contrasted to Danish, Frenish, etc., from Engel, plural, the Angles, the name of the Germanic groups that overran the island in the 5th century, supposedly so called because Angel, the land they inhabited on the Jutland coast, was shaped like a fish hook. The term was used from the earliest times without distinction from all the Germanic invaders, Angles, Saxons and Jutes, and applied to their group of related languages by Alfred the Great. After 1066, the population of England, as distinguished from Normans and French, a distinction which lasted only about a generation. The etymology of Albion. Albion. Ancient name of England, Old English, from Latin, sometimes said to be from the non-Indo-European base Alb, meaning mountain, which also is suggested as the source of Latin Alps, Albania and Alba, an Irish name for Scotland, but more likely from Latin Albus, meaning white, see Alb, which would be an apt description of the chalk cliffs of the island's southern coast. <coughs> Etymology of Britain, 1300, allegedly. Bretagne, from Old French Bretagne, <laughs> and my pronunciation is appalling, so please forgive me, from Latin Britannia, earlier Britannia, from Brittany, the Britons, see Britain. The Old English place name Britainland meant Wales. If there was a Celtic name for the island, it has not been recorded. Oh, really? From 757 to 796, Offa House of Mercia. 802 to 839, Egbert House of Wessex. The next one, Athelwolf House of Wessex. Athelbold House of Wessex. Athelbert House of Wessex. Athelred House of Wessex. Alfred the Great House of Wessex. Edward the Elder House of Wessex. Athelston House of Wessex. Edmund House of Wessex, and that takes us up to 946. Edred House of Wessex, Edwy House of Wessex, Edgar House of Wessex, Edward the Martyr House of Wessex, Ethelred the Unready House of Wessex, Edmund Ironside, not in a chair, I don't think, House of Wessex, King Canute, now you have to get that right, it's very easy not to do, King Canute, House of Denmark. And this, this takes us up to 1035. At 1035 to 1040, Harold the I, Harefoot, House of Denmark, 1040 to 1042, Harthur Canute, House of Denmark, 1042 to 1066, critical year, Edward the Confessor, 1066, same year, Harold II, back to the House of Wessex, and 1066 to 1087, William the Bastard, the House of Norman. Historia Ecclesiastica, Gentis Anglorum, by the Venerable Bede. This is one of the, the most quoted historical documents and it's one of the oldest he lived from 673 to 735 and he, he lived over the Tyne from where I am currently based Britain an island in the ocean formerly called Albion is situated between the north and west facing though at a considerable distance the coasts of Germany France and Spain which form the greatest part of Europe this island at present following the number of the books in which the divine law was written He's talking about the ecclesiastical histories written by the Church of Rome. Contains five nations, the English, the Britons, notice the distinction, Scots, Picts and Latins, each in its own particular dialect cultivating the sublime study of divine truth. The Latin tongue is by the study of the scriptures become more common to all the rest. At first, this island had no other inhabitants but the Britons, from whom it derived its name and who, coming over into Britain, as is reported from Amoriga, <laughs> possessed themselves of the southern parts thereof. This is the Historia Britonum by Nennius, and this is the version translated by J.A. Giles. The island of Britain derives its name from Brutus, a Roman consul. Its inhabitants consist of four different people, <coughs> the Scots, the Picts, the Saxons, and the ancient Britons. Where's the fifth gone? This is after Bede. It is fertilized by several rivers which traverse it in all directions, to the east and west, to the <laughs> south and north, but there are two preeminently distinguished among the rest, the Thames and the Severn, which formerly, like the two arms of Britain, bore the ships employed in the conveyance of riches acquired by commerce. The Britons were once very populous and exercised extensive dominion from sea to sea. So this is the ninth century. This is a, a revered history of Britain, and he's saying that through commerce, the Britons, they brought in untold wealth. 
Well, weren't we told at school that we were just a bunch of savages who were civilised by the Anglo-Saxons and we had no laws, no equity, no justice. It was just a free-for-all. Oh, I certainly was. This is the Irish version of Historia Britonum. I have taken pains to write certain fragments and I am Nenamnis, that's another version of Nenius, a disciple of Eulodark, because the folly of the ignorance of the nation of Britannia have given to oblivion the history and origin of its first people, so that they are not commemorated in writings nor in books. But I have brought together the histories that I found in the annals of Rome, out of the chronicles of the learned saints Isidora, Jerome and Eusebius, in the annals of the Saxons and the Gaels, and what I discovered from the tradition of our own old men. Numerous are its cares or cities, innumerable its rafts or forts and its fortified castles. Four races inhabit the island of Britain, the Gaels, the Kruthnak Picts, the Britons and the Saxons. Again, the Latins are missed out. The Britons at first filled the whole island with their children, from the Sea of Ict to the Sea of Ork, both with glory and excellency. Now this document, this is one of the most suppressed documents of all time, the Brutisolo, also known as the Chronicle of England, or the Chronicle of Britain, or the Britons. And this again, it's a translation from an Oxford historian. So, and as we go on, you'll see the plethora of deceptions, or omissions, or mistakes, depending on which way you want to look at it. Britain, the best of the islands, which used to be called Albion, the White Island, situated as it is in the Western Ocean between Frank and Ewerden, that's France and Ireland, extends 800 miles in its length and 200 in its width, and whatever men must need use, it supplies them in unfailing plenty. And with this, it is full of numerous wide-spreading plains and noble hills and havens to which, from overseas, come foreign products in great variety. And there are also in it forests and thickets full of various kinds of animals and wild beasts, and many swarms of bees gathering honey among the flowers. There are with this fair pastures at the front of the windswept mountains and bright clear springs, and further there are lakes and rivers full of various varieties of fish, and so it is peopled by five nations, the Britanniat, the Normandiad, the Cesson, Saxons, and the Ficti <laughs> the Picts, <laughs> that's the Picts, um, and the Isagotide. Of all of these, the Britanniad were the first to settle from Morid, the Channel, as far as the Sea of Eden, the Irish Sea, until the vengeance of God came upon them for their sins. Well, it's another monk talking. Now we come to the triads of the Isle of Prydain. Can you remember any of those historians talking about Prydain? <laughs> no. And these triads, they predate all of those historical works, because these are the triads of the Bards who were supposedly the Welsh bards, but they were really the Britons, the British bards. The bards were the conveyors of the knowledge and the wisdom that was handed down from, from generation to generation when things were not committed to paper for fear that people would lose the memory of them. One, there were three names given to the Isle of Prydain. Before it was inhabited, it was called the Seagird Greenland. Later, it was called the Honey Island. The people formed a tribe called the Cymry on the Isle of Prydain after Prydain Ap Aed the Great. And no one has any right to it but the tribe of the Cymry, for they first took possession, and before this time there were no persons living on it, but it was full of bears, wolves, crocodiles and bison. The key to the history of these lands lies in the history of the Cambrians, as they were formerly known, the Welsh, the Cymry. Two. There were three primary divisions of the Isle of Prydain, Cymru, Lugria and Alban. Sound like Albion? The rank of sovereignty belongs to each of the three under a monarchy and voice of the country. They are governed according to the regulations of Prydain and to the nation of the Cymru belongs the right of establishing the monarchy by the voice of the country and the people according to rank and primeval right under the protection of such regulation. Royalty ought to exist in every country in the Isle of Prydain, and every royalty ought to be under the protection of the voice of the country. Therefore it is said, the country is more powerful than the Lord. 3. There are three pillars of the social state in the Isle of Prydain. They are the voice of the country, royalty and judicature, according to the regulation of Prydain. 4. 
There are three pillars of the nation of the Isle of Prydain. The first was Hugh the Mighty, who brought the nation of the Cymri first to the island of Prydain. And they came from the summer country, which is also called Defrobani, the summer land, or Atlantia. And they came over the hazy sea to the Isle of Prydain, where they settled. The second was Prydain, who first organized a social state of sovereignty in the land of Prydain. For before that time there was no justice but what was done by favour, nor any law except that of superior force. The third was, and this guy is probably the most amazing of all the hidden British kings. The third was Divinwal Malmud, for he first made arrangements respecting the laws, maxims, customs and privileges of the country and the tribe, and by these reasons they were called the three pillars of the nation of the Cymri. Five, there were three social tribes of the Isle of Prydain. The first was the tribe of the Cymri, who came to the Isle of Prydain with Hugh the Mighty because he would not possess a country and lands by fighting and pursuit, but by justice and tranquility. The second was a tribe of Lugrians, who came from Gascony, and they were descended from the tribe of the Cymri. The third were the Brythons, who came from Amorica, and were descended from the tribe of the Cymri. These were called the three peaceful tribes because they came by mutual consent and tranquility. And these tribes were descended from the primitive tribe of the Cymri, and all three tribes had the same speech. This was one nation with many different clans and three different sovereignties, all coexisting without war, without conquest, and without tyranny. Six. There were three refuge-seeking tribes that came to the island of Prydain, and they came under the peace and permission of the tribe of the Cymri, without arms and without opposition. The first was a tribe of Caledonians in the north. The second was the Irish tribe, who dwelled in the highlands of Scotland. The third were the people of Galidon, who came in naked... That's Holland, the Low Countries. Who came in naked vessels to the Isle of Wight when their country was drowned, where they had <coughs> land granted to them by the tribe of the Cymri. They had no privilege of claim in the island of Prydain, but they had land and protection assigned to them under certain limitations, and it was stipulated that they should not possess the rank of native Cymri until the ninth <coughs> of their lineal descendants. Nine generations down, they became natives of Britain. 7. There were three invading tribes that came to the island of Prydain and who never departed from it. The first were the Coranians, who came from the country of Powell. The second were the Irish Picts, who came to Alban by the North Sea. The third were the Saxons. The Coranians were settled about the River Humber and the shore of the German Ocean. The Irish Picts are in Alban, about the shore of the Sea of Denmark. The Coranians and the Saxons united, and by violence and conquest brought the Lugrians into confederacy with them, and subsequently took the crown of the monarchy from the tribe of the Cymri. There remained none of the Lugrians that did not become Saxons, except those that are found in Cornwall and the Comot of Canaban in Dera and Benicia in this period. In this manner, the benevolent tribe of the Cymri, who <coughs> preserved both their country and their language, lost the sovereignty of the island of Prydain on account of the treachery of the refuge-seeking tribes and the pillage of the three invading tribes. History of Britain from the Flood to AD 700 by Richard Williams Morgan. The notions so sedulously inculcated first by pagan, then by papal Rome, that all nations except the two occupying the little peninsulas of Greece and Italy were barbarians, may be now classed among the obsolete impositions on medieval credulity. It must at the same time be conceded that the Roman polity did not commence with the first Latin authors, whose date is barely a century before Julius Caesar, that would be 54 BC around about and that the refinement of the prehistoric age, which could produce an Iliad, was something very wide indeed from a myth. The Trojan descent of the Britons has been assigned the place to which it is substantially entitled in this history. It solves the numerous and very peculiar agreements in the social and military systems of prehistoric Britain and Asia, which would otherwise remain inexplicable. It has always been consistently maintained by native authorities, and by extending the circle of researches, it is found to receive ample and unexpected confirmations from the earliest documents of Italy, Gaul, Britannia, Spain, and even Iceland. On equally solid grounds of evidence, the social state of Britain has been described 
As from its first settlement by Hugh the Mighty, again this is confirming what we've already read in the more ancient texts, that of a civilised and polished community, had no other monument of Cymric antiquity but the code of British laws of Malmitius, he says BC 600 but it was actually BC 400, around about then, which still forms the basis of our common or unwritten law, descended to us. We could not doubt that we were handling the index of a civilization of a very high order. In such a code, we possess not only the most splendid relic of pre-Roman Europe, but the key to all our British, as contradistinguished from continental institutions. After perusing it, we stand amazed at the blindness which wanders groping for the origin of British rights and liberties in the swamps of the motherland of feudal serfdom, Germany. What, what we've just been through for the lads who've just come in, what we've just been through is the basic... No, I really can't explain. I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we come back to the Brutissolo, the much-suppressed ancient history. And the kingdom was rent into five parts, each part under its own king, which kings continually fought one another. After many years, there arose a famous youth named Donvalo Malmitius. He was the son of Clotten a petty king of Cornwall, and his beauty and courage outshone that of all the kings of Britain. And he restored the land to its ancient dignity, and compiled laws which are known to this day as the laws of Donvalo Malmitius, which even the Saxons obey. And he granted right of sanctuary to temples and to cities, and even to certain roads defined by law, so that any man who fled to them, whatever wrong he had done, should find sanctuary there, unimpeded and without license from his foes. Now, this is uh, an essay by, uh, uh, again, uh, a, a guy who had connections with Oxbridge, but he certainly wasn't an establishment man, and you'll get that from this quote. His name's Flinders Petrie. The condition of pagan Britain is remarkably preserved in the laws of Divinwall Mulmud. That these laws are certainly long before the 10th century is proved by the gulf that exists between the state of society shown by them and that of the laws of Howell, fixed to AD 914. The laws of Howell refer back to Molmud. What takes the laws of Molmud at least to Roman times is that they are purely pagan, he means Druidic. How much farther back those laws may date, towards the traditional time of Molmud, the 4th or 7th century BC, we cannot now inquire. That's because of how much history has been erased. The whole air is that of simple conditions and a free life, with much personal cultivation and sympathy and general conduct. It would be impossible to produce such a code from a savage or violent people, and this intimate view of their life is the best ground for judging of their qualities. Okay, this is a Stuart's historian, so an establishment historian we're talking about here. Percy Enderby says in his history published in 1661 that Malmitius took upon himself the government of Brittany, i.e. Britain, in the year of the world's creation 4748. Meanwhile, the Tudor historian Hollinshed reported in the 1587 edition of the Chronicles that Malmitius began his reign over the whole monarchy of Britain in the year of the world 3529, that's 439 BC in the current calendar. Both authors agree with Tissolo on the reign's duration of 40 years. Given that the foundation of Rome was in 753 BC, Malmitius's reign was 439 to 399 BC. This is right for Malmitius's son Brennus to be the enemy commander at the sack of Rome in 390 BC and to be named as such by the Roman historian Livy. We're talking about the sack of Rome by the son of Malmitius the ancient creator of the British common law system, which still, though hidden from view, exists today. It's never been repealed. It couldn't be repealed because it requires a convention of the people. It cannot be repealed by any so-called government, especially a government of usurpers, pirates and genocidal maniacs. The Ancient Laws of Cambria, William Probart, circa 1823. These triads are remarkably curious and interesting. They throw great light upon the manners and customs of the old Britons, and in many cases breathe a spirit of freedom that would not disgrace the polish of the 19th century. These triads also merit attention on account of their antiquity. They were framed by Divinwall Molmud, 
who flourished about 400 years before the Christian era and consequently are upwards of 2,000 years old. There are three tests of civil liberty. Equality of rights, equality of taxation, freedom to come and go. There are three causes which ruin a state. Inordinate privileges, corruption of justice and national apathy. Ring any bells? <laughs> there are three things which cannot be considered solid longer than their foundations are solid. Peace, property and law. Three things are indispensable to a true union of nations. Sameness of laws, rights and language. There are three things free to all Britons. The forest, the unworked mine, the right of hunting wild creatures. There are three things which are private and sacred property in every man, Briton or foreigner. His wife, his children, his domestic chattels. There are three things belonging to a man which no law of men can touch, fine or transfer. His wife, his children and the instruments of his calling. For no law can unman a man or uncall a calling. There are three persons. Is that a legal fiction? Is it? No. They're talking about men and women. They're not talking about a legal fiction. There are three persons in a family exempted from all manual or menial work. The little child, the old man or woman, and the family instructor, the tutor, the educator, the real educator. There are three orders against whom no weapon can be bared. The herald, the bard, and the head of a clan. There are three of private rank against whom no weapon can be bared. A woman, a child under 15, and an unarmed man. There are three things that require the unanimous vote of the nation to effect. The deposition of the sovereign, the introduction of novelties in religion, and suspension of law. There are three civil birthrights of every Briton. The right to go wherever he pleases. The right wherever he is to protection from his land and sovereign. The right of equal privileges and equal restrictions. There are three property birthrights of every Briton. Five British acres of land for a home. The right of armorial bearings, the right to carry arms. The right of suffrage, which is voting. In the enacting of the laws. The male at 21, the female on her marriage. So the women generally married before 21 had a vote before the men. There are three guarantees of society. Security for life and limb. Security for property, security of the rights of nature. There are three sons of captives who free themselves, a bard, a scholar, a mechanic. There are three things the safety of which depends on that of the others, the sovereignty, national courage, and just administration of the laws. There are three things which every Briton may legally be compelled to attend, the worship of God, military service, and the courts of law. For three things a Briton is pronounced a traitor and forfeits his rights. Emigration, collusion with an enemy, and surrendering himself and living under an enemy. There are three things free to every man, Briton or foreigner, the refusal of which no law will justify. Water from a spring, river or well, firing from a decayed tree, a block of stone not in use. There are three orders who are exempt from bearing arms, the bard, the judge, the graduate in law or religion. These represent God and his peace, and no weapon must ever be found in their hand. There are three kinds of sonship, a son by marriage with a native Briton, an illegitimate son acknowledged on oath by his father, and a son adopted out of the clan. But that goes for daughters as well. There are three whose power is kingly in law, the sovereign paramount of Britain over all Britain and its isles, the princes palatine in their princedoms, and the heads of the clans in their clans. Three are the thieves who shall not suffer punishment, a woman compelled by her husband, a child, a necessitous person who has gone through three towns and a nine houses in each town without being able to obtain charity though he asked for it. There are three ends of law, prevention of wrong, punishment for wrongs inflicted, and insurance of just retribution. There are three lawful castigations, of a son by a father, of a kinsman by the head of a clan, of a soldier by his officer. The chief of a clan, when marshalling his men, may strike his man three ways, with his baton, with the flat of his sword, with his open hand. Each of these is a correction, not an insult. There are three sacred things by which the conscience binds itself to truth. The name of God, the rod of him who offers up prayers to God, the joined right hand. 
There are three persons who have a right to public maintenance. The old, the babe, the foreigner who cannot speak the British tongue. We're certainly not talking about a set of laws which could all be applied today fairly, equitably or justly. But many of them could be. And many of them still form the basis of the common law. Alfred the Great, the so-called Anglo-Saxon lawmaker, he incorporated the Mormontine laws into the Saxon laws before all of the indigenous tribes of Britain, as opposed to the invading tribes, had been wiped out. What they did was they created a hierarchy which didn't exist. There was no social hierarchy. There were only roles, rights and responsibilities. Malmud, who created the laws, had no more rights except within his role as sovereign paramount than any other man or woman. In other words, let's just say you had a beef with the king. You could ask the king for a duel. But this didn't often happen because generally the kings who wronged the people were removed. Because remember it said, in the Mormontine laws it says that the people, the voice of the country, was above the king or the queen, above. Any despotic ruler at any time before the Saxon genocide, anybody could be deposed by a simple process. That process was an aggrieved party went to the head of his clan and said, I've got this grievance. I think we should secede or, or we should form our own sovereign nation outside of this despot. They held a vote in their clan and that was it. They were outside. It had to be accepted. Now, that didn't mean that whoever they had the grudge against or the dispute with, that didn't mean that they couldn't wage war against them, and they very often did. There have been endless civil wars, but Mormud, he put an end to them. And the reason he did it is because he created a much fairer system than had ever existed before. And he confirmed that everybody had the same rights. Everybody was born with these unalienable rights. Now, why is it, do you think, that they've been able to get away with erasing so much of this from view. Why is it? Let's, let's look at it this way. Which is the only species on this planet that has to pay for its very existence on it? Us. <coughs> Who's free? Who's free? Is there any one of us in this room who isn't six weeks away from getting evicted by pirates? I don't think so. I'm including myself. And I'm completely outside of their system. But if they made a claim against me and their corrupt system decided it was going to be enforced, I would have the bailiffs coming round and chucking my family on the streets just like everybody else. The reason they're not doing it is because I've put up a defensive force which they don't want to take on. And the reason they don't want to take it on is because I've declared a new social state into existence. And that's what we're going to talk about in the second section. And that social state is universal community trust. And it isn't just me. But it's based, it's founded upon the ancient laws of Mormud. These laws were never repealed. They were only obscured and obliterated by conquest and deception. This is the most infectious information that I've ever come across. Because all of a sudden, I understand why there are so many of us on these islands now. And yet, the vast majority are sitting there, fucked out of their heads on statins or alcohol or some other synthetic drug that doesn't come from the ground. It comes from the arms, the tentacles of the mass murderers, the genocidal maniacs who've been running things for so long through deception and control of everything. And I, I know that we're already on the same page because we know that the common man, despite the ancient laws of these lands, which were the freest lands in this part of the hemisphere, at least during the last 12,000 years, where people came to live freely, where babies were born and they had a right to live and exist above everything else, that no one could take from a man and his family the land that they were living on and all of the things above and below it. And they're taking the homes of good, 
decent, honest people who have obeyed the rules their whole lives because they thought that was the way they were going to get on. That was the way they were going to advance themselves in life. And it never happened. I, I, I go out my front door and I see everywhere I go, miserable people, pissed off people, people who fucking hate every single day. It's a drudgery. They can't stand it. They need... Breathe. <laughs> My daughter saw a little boy on a bouncy castle jumping up and down on little boys' and little girls' chests, making them cry and laughing. She went over, and she's three and a half, and she's never experienced anything like this, but we've discussed what to do if she ever sees a bully, or if she's ever bullied. So she goes over to him and says, No, don't do that. That's wrong. Stop it. And he, he got up with it, because I was watching it. And I was about to intervene, but I couldn't because this is a critical moment in her life. She'll never fear bullies because she's standing up to a bully. I had to let it go. And he went to push her and she grabbed his arms and pushed him back and said, No, don't do that to me. You shouldn't be here. Now, I didn't put her up to that. I just told her about situations where she might have to deal with bullies. This is a little girl who's never had a single letter from the state with her name on it. This is a little girl who, she gets up in the morning and she's a hundred miles an hour and from the moment I looked into her eyes, she knew exactly what she wanted to do. And the first moment of, I can only describe it as a telepathic empathy when I'm holding her in my arms, she's a few weeks old and I'm smiling and I look down and I say, what is it you came here to do, little girl? What is it? And immediately in my head, I heard the voice that I hadn't heard. I'm here to help daddy. And I'll tell you that after the story about her intervening with a bully. He wasn't bullying her. She prevented that. But she didn't want to see other people getting bullied. The state is the biggest bully of the lot. Yes. There is no legitimate government except self-government. Yes. None. It's a myth. There is no good government. Oh, let's make it really small. Really small with the same powers to really fuck your life up. To punish you if you don't do what you're told, no matter which state department it is, there are people getting their kids taken from them in this country now for expressing an opinion, for having the wrong opinion. Maybe feminism has had a detrimental effect on the world, as well as a positive effect in certain respects. Maybe we've got a situation here where generally men, it's, it's okay to demean them socially. It's okay to insult men. But if you even suggest that a feminist woman has an opinion that might be questionable, you're castigated, you're ostracized. Now, I'm saying we're not all the same. We're all unique with all the same rights. We all have it within us to create a world that is so much better than it is now because it has been in the past. That's why they don't want us to know this history we've been talking about. They don't want us to know that whoever came to these lands was free. There is good in the world. There is good. But there's very little good among the elite. The moneyed aristocracy who've controlled everything, at least since the Battle of Waterloo. I was 18 and my mother was having a nervous breakdown. My dad took her away. I moved house on my own. It was an eviction. The agreement was they wouldn't send bailiffs because I was doing it and we wouldn't resist it. And then I'm standing on the grass, the removal men have gone and I've been in my A-level history exam and I've written a little note about the day I've had and explained why I haven't done any revision whatsoever on the European Renaissance and could he take pity on me because I needed at least a pass to get out of Newcastle and go to university. Now, the fact is, I passed it. But when I'm standing there wondering whether I'll pass on the grass and looking at the house for the last time, thinking about all my formative years, all the things that happened there, you know, that, that all the memories that I'll always have about that place and my family will, and that we were being chucked out on our asses on the street with not a pot to piss in for one simple reason. A bank said me dad owed money. Well, I wanted to know if he really did owe the money. And I'm standing on the grass wondering if he really did owe the money. I really wanted to know. And then at that moment, 
an E-type Jag pulled up onto the grass, half onto the grass, the wheels, he was a few feet away from me, and I knew instinctively it was the official receiver. I'd never met him, didn't know what he looked like, and it was him. And I turned round, and he, he looked at me, wound, he wound his electric window down, and that was quite high for Luton for the time, 1987. And basically wound it down, and it's smug face in a, in, a, in a suit sitting there. And he said, is your dad in? And I didn't say anything. And he said, tell your dad that if everything's not out by the end of the day, then we're just going to sell it. And I looked at him without blinking, and I said, if you're not gone in 10 seconds, I won't be responsible for my actions. <laughs> and I just stared at him. And he tried a little smirk and a laugh, and then he got a little bit scared. But I was just a kid. He was the official receiver. So I looked at him, and I started counting. And by the time I got to three, he fucked off. <laughs> that moment, I don't think I've ever felt so lost at sea, so emotionally wrought without a shoulder to cry on. And then I thought, no, I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. I'm going to get on with it. And that's what I did. But I would not even contemplate being a father of a child until I at least had a handle on how I might spend the rest of my life doing what I could every day just to do my best to make the world a better place for my daughter and my family and my community and everybody else on the earth to live in a better condition than we have been subjected to. And we have been subjected to it. But it's through our acquiescence to the system. There's a mind program, there's a meme which is being put out in the independent media which teaches people not to resist. What you resist will persist, they say. Bullshit. What you resist will eventually stop. I declared the founding of the Universal Community Mission. <laughs> and served the declaration on Elizabeth Windsor near Rothschild <laughs> on the around about the 28th of March 2009. This was after I'd sent a, a, de a previous declaration in September 2008 called a Notice of Understanding and in an Intent and Claim of Right. And at the time, myself and a guy called Amit Zala, who was one of the three of us who did the original Freeman Conference in November 2008, within a few days of each other, we sent this declaration to the Queen, believing that other people had already done it, because we'd heard that they had on certain forums but had no proof. We later found out that while at the same time John Harris was sending affidavits to the Queen in lawful rebellion, as others were, we were the first to send anything of this type to the Queen. Now, when I made the declaration the following year in the March, it was an amendment of that document. But as of the date that I served the original document, that was the date I revoked my consent to be governed and took control of the name on the birth certificate, which I've used as a trade name since then to interact with their system whenever I've had to, which has really only been in legal proceedings. I haven't paid any income tax or sent a tax return since I think it's around about 2003 now. And as I've been saying, we didn't register. She's not going to school and neither will any of our other children. But I can't expect you to even, to even consider whether or not you could apply these things in your life, if at all without offering some kind of idea about what we might create, well, it's going to take the rise of the people in every community. It's not going to take people waiting for someone else to do it for them or expecting there to be a replacement welfare state because we've all got a unique contribution. But what it's going to take is a group of people coming together and saying, right, are we all agreed on these basic principles? And that's effectively what UCT is. It's a community of sovereign indigenous nations. The ratification of the Treaty of Universal Community Trust took place on the summer solstice 2012 by 26 newly formed community trusts. While it's certainly not easy getting out of the system, you may have to go through a period where you have one foot in and one foot out. But there comes a time where you have to make a decision. Because until you revoke your consent to be governed formally, until you no longer take any benefits and privileges from the state, until you get to that point, until you free yourself from the trap, and it is a trap, until you start every day, bit by bit, to rebuild the communities that have been destroyed all over these lands, it's not going to get any better.
I got rid of all the problems I had. Seven threats of legal proceedings by Crown agencies in the early summer, late spring of 2008. Within a year, every single one of them was gone and I was not a taxpayer anymore. Every single one of them was gone because I revoked my consent to be governed and I told them I am not going to give a single penny to a state that is responsible for the killing of innocent children, women and men in foreign shores. I'm not going to do it. And I resent every penny that I have to pay in VAT and all the other hidden taxes. But there's virtually nothing you can do about that. Virtually. Oh, well, but you know what? You could be better off if you just got child benefit. And most people capitulate because they're hard up. Most people are hard up. Only the lords in their castles are not suffering. Well, ain't that the truth? And I don't know anybody who's had any kind of pay rise that wasn't lower than the rate of inflation over the past five years, and yet the banks are still getting bailed out. People are still getting kicked out of their homes for void mortgages. We can stop this. We don't need a violent revolution. We need organised, spontaneous resistance in every single community. Just because the will is there, I've never felt like we have the opportunity that we have now. Now is the time that people need to rise up. There's no time to spare. It's not that they're going to thwart us. It's not that they're going to destroy us. It's that they're already doing it. we got to stop it. No more poisons in the vaccines, poisons in the water. No more poisoning the air supply. No more the local council getting you arrested for not paying unlawful property taxes. No more social services coming in and taking your kids off you because you had a row with your wife and you might have said something that you regret. No more genocide on foreign shores. No more institutionalised frauds. I've learned so much. I'm sure all parents in the room will say that the greatest learning experience of all is when you have children. Because it changes everything immediately, and it really does. And you can't be told it if you haven't got children. You can't be told it. But it does, and it should. Because I cannot look forward 25 years from now, sitting in what is ostensibly a grey prison-like block of flats in the dystopian vision dreamt up by the sick fox like Huxley. I can't. Be sitting in that place with my daughter, having no freedom to go anywhere, no freedom to do anything, having to do what she's told, even though at the very beginning we really tried to do it right and keep her out of all that bullshit. I can't just say, right, there you go. It's up to you and your generation. I've got to spend every day of my life trying to make this come about because this isn't something that I made up. It isn't even something that the trustees collectively of UCT made up. This is something based on all of our collective researches about what really constitutes natural law and natural rights and real equity because the real remedy is never in law. The law can tell you to do a crime and it's all right because of statute black magic. Equity will not allow a statute to do that. And what we try to do is to devise a system of equity, which isn't a law forum, even though it's an adaptation of the ancient Malmatine laws, as you'll see. Proclamation of independence, sovereignty and jurisdiction. Let it be known by all concerned, affected and interested parties that the independence and sovereignty of the communities of indigenous free peoples who ratify this treaty is hereby proclaimed, declared and affirmed without equivocation and is vested solely in the men and women of those communities, both individually and collectively, notwithstanding the fact that their representatives may be authorised by each to act in a sovereign capacity on their collective behalf in strictly limited sets of circumstances, such as those mankind currently finds itself in, for the purposes of achieving the inter-community consensus required to establish a supreme jurisdiction under the guiding principles of natural law, supplemented and interpreted in this Treaty of Universal Community Trust with a view to peacefully bringing about the following aims and objectives. An end to all crimes against mankind and the earth that are currently being perpetrated by governments, whether elected or not, corporations, organisations, individuals and legal entities of all natures and descriptions. 
Two, the dismantling of all industries which by developing, manufacturing and exploiting for profit any substance product or byproduct cause actual damage, harm, injury or loss to mankind and all the earth. Three, the deconstruction of unsustainable fiscal systems that would facilitate one man to have and one man to have not, including, without limitation, the abolition of usury in all its forms and the demonopolization of land rights, international borders, mediums of exchange, trading platforms and the means of communicating, publishing and distributing information. Four, the nullifying settlement and or discharge of all outstanding or allegedly owed debts, obligations and liabilities with a view to replacing unaccountable, unsustainable and inequitable usury-based financial systems with localised and autonomous permanent credit facilities or depositories in every community that stands under the jurisdiction of Universal Community Trust. 5. The eradication of all forms of artificial scarcity and its effects, including homelessness, famine and disease, by and through the facilitation of a naturally abundant, peaceful, free and harmonious environment for mankind to dwell, and the distribution of organic materials, agricultural produce, seeds and proven natural health remedies. 6. The dissolution of mankind's dependence upon fossil fuel industries for the production of energy, including without limitation coal seam gas mining, fracking, it's not in there but it's going to be, coal-fired power stations and oil drilling, as well as the cessation of all toxic pollution of the biosphere of the earth in any detrimental form whatsoever, whether it be gaseous, liquid, solid or radioactive, and the closure and cleanup of all, of all unsafe nuclear power facilities. 7. The rapid development, manufacture, distribution and implementation of new and existing free and clean energy technologies in every community upon the earth under universal community trust. 8. A ceasefire in all wars, the repatriation of all armed services personnel following the repudiation of all unlawful allegiances and the setting aside of all oaths made in the service of private interests to the detriment of mankind and the unequivocal commitment of the parties to this treaty to recall and withdraw any and all beneficiaries of universal community trust from every armed conflict at the earliest opportunity. 9. The establishment of cooperative trade networks in and between all communities with a view to promoting the localization of trade, self-sufficiency, mutual cooperation and the eventual replacement of money with unconditional pledges of sweat equity which shall form the basis of the permanent credit of every beneficiary of Universal Community Trust. 10. An agreement that privately issued promissory notes made payable to bear on demand by any grantor, trustee or beneficiary of Universal Community Trust may be used for the purposes of settling any valid financial obligation or to create credits in their account held at the community's depository, the balance of which will be transferable to any account in another jurisdiction, provided those credits are not used for any purpose that is detrimental to mankind and all the earth. 11. The nullifying of any and all judicial proceedings and convictions for victimless crimes, as well as the positive law which legalised such unlawful proceedings, and the prohibition and prevention of any man being charged with future crimes. 12. The facilitation of the re-emergence of the universal bond of common unity between the free indigenous peoples of the earth in order to achieve these aims and objectives in the most peaceful, amicable and equitable manners. In acknowledgement of the ancient usages, rights and customs of the free indigenous peoples of the earth, the parties to this treaty agree as follows. There are three foundations of every community. Common unity, peaceful possession and equity for all. There are three foundations of equity. Protection, correction and natural justice. There are three protections and securities for every member of the community, of life and the body, of the place we make a home, and of our natural rights. There are three energies of equitable resolutions, a learned arbitrator or jury, a faithful witness, and a conscientious verdict. There are three mandatory qualifications of every jury or arbitrator of a dispute or complaint, a full and complete knowledge of the facts of the matter, the customs of the community, and the tendencies and consequences of the times. There are three things which every arbitrator should constantly study. Natural truth, conscientious forgiveness, and the energetic diktats of knowledge. There are three indispensabilities of every community. The sovereignty of the self-governed, the voice of the people being heard without prejudice, and the consistent and unbiased administration of equity. There are three universally binding actions that should require the verdict of a supreme grand jury of 13 sovereign representatives to effect in any nation the deposition of a de facto government or acting sovereign paramount, the banishment of criminal religious institutions and monarchies, and the equitable reclamation of the lands, resources and properties unlawfully held by such parties, and the suspension or repudiation of laws and instruments that do not benefit mankind and or cause damage to the earth. There are three unalienable birthrights, 
the right to peaceful possession of a parcel of land fit for the purposes of building a home, growing food and raising a family, with unrestricted access to clean, unpolluted water, as well as the minerals below and the airspace above it. The right to use all necessary and reasonable defences to protect the body, family and property from theft, fraud, damage, harm and loss, and the right to self-determination under natural law. There are three guarantees of every community which has the voluntary consent of its sovereign people. Security for life and limb, security for property held in peaceful possession without malfeasance, theft or fraud, and security of the right to self-determination. There are three things the safety of which depends on that of the others. The sovereignty of the people, the integrity and fairness of a nation's domestic and foreign policies, and the consistent and unbiased administration of equity. There are three things free to everybody upon the earth, the refusal of which no law can justify. Food from an abundant field, forest or orchard, water from spring, river, tap or well, for any individual or family in dire need of sustenance, firing from a decayed tree or fence, and peaceful possession of a dwelling or land not in fair use or proven to be rightfully held following due public notice of a claim by a landless or homeless individual or family or community. There are three thieves who should not suffer proceedings against them. Any individual compelled under, under the force of another, any child under 16 years, and anybody who is suffering from any form of generally accepted mental illness, incapacity or disease. There are three rightful applications of equity. Prevention of actual suffering, harm, injury, damage and loss. Compensation and or restitution for all injured parties. And assurance of equitable resolutions, peaceful civil proceedings and the reconciliation of the accused with their accusers. There are three sacred conventions of universal community trust. A convention of families assembled for the purposes of founding a community a convention of arbitrators for the purposes of administering equity, and a convention of sovereign community trusts assembled for the purposes of establishing independence, accession and jurisdiction. It is self-evident that freedom cannot coexist with inequality of rights and restrictions, taxation of labour or sweat equity, and the restriction of our freedom to come and go as we please. Any sovereign nation of free indigenous people is necessarily ruined by inordinate privileges for the few, corruption of justice, and a general national apathy to injustices which have become all too prevalent in the so-called modern societies. Long-lasting peace under natural law cannot be established without an end to all wars between nations, the demonopolization of land rights and natural resources, and the repudiation of all laws that were made by mankind to its own detriment and that of the earth. Let it be known by all that no law can unman a man or uncall a calling. There are three things which promote common unity, empathy, respect and unconditional love for our fellow man. There are three things which strengthen common unity, effective protection and security for every man and his property, just correction wherever it is required and forgiveness derived from an equitable cause. There are three things that destroy common unity, cruel and unjust punishments, forgiveness derived from blind respect and partiality and false judgment where no man can obtain natural protection. There are three pillars of every community, sovereignty of the individual and the nation, the voice of the people, and equitable resolutions of disputes and complaints. There are three things which ought to belong to each of these three pillars, equity to all, protection and defence to all, and open source information for the instruction, knowledge and records of all. There are three elements of equitable resolutions, right knowledge, natural right, and conscientious rectitude. I once believed I would create a work of fiction that might inspire people to create something like this. So I decided to stop working in fictions and attempt to just envisage what I already know in my heart, even though I can't cognitively express it to you now, I already know in my heart from my previous experiences of my soul on this planet we are bringing with us memories of what things were like and the descent that we've been through. Virtually everybody on these islands is suffering from some form of post-traumatic stress disorder because of some, whatever the tyranny was, that they've experienced. Now, there are some of us who stand up to that and give reasonable force back in whatever form is necessary and some of those people are never bothered again. 
and some of them end up getting thrown in prison. And worse, some of them end up dead. The fact is, we don't need to go to their system with a begging bowl anymore when there's an organised community which is based on the common unity that's held between all within it to prevent injustices from happening, to prevent people from getting thrown out of their homes. And, you know, to, to take back all of the pieces of land that have been stolen from us by the crown. Because under international law and the law of nations, it is unlawful for the usurpers, pirates and genocidal maniacs who've held these lands in the same bloodline, despite the fact that they've hidden behind the House of Rothschild and the church for the best part of a millennia, it's that, that, that these people are still holding the reins of the ill-gotten gains of conquest is unlawful under their rules, under UN conventions, under the Kellogg Pact. In other words, we now have the proof that these lands were taken by conquest and the indigenous peoples were wiped out, but not just here, virtually everywhere. It isn't going to take taking up arms, getting an army together, getting weapons together. It isn't. It's going to stop if we use our ingenuity and we decide that it's just not going to happen where we live anymore. The councils have got to be divested of their power if we held a local meeting and declared the council null and void and slapped liens on them for acquiescing to the spraying of the chemicals in the air, the poisoning of the water supply and all of the rest of the bullshit that they've imposed upon us for profit.